Am I losing my mind? Yes. Have I lost my entire mind? No, of course not. And why is that? That is because I, uh, I paint. I have painting. I love painting. I, uh, have my degree in it and, and <laughs> have since failed to make any money doing it, um, but I still enjoy it so much. And one of the things that I got out of a painting education was this book, which is The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. And Henry was a he was an American painter who was studying in Paris, uh, late 1800s. And he's really well known for his portraits. He's very good at capturing sort of the blush of a person. And <laughs> he's got a lot to say. And he's a great writer, too. You don't, um, you know, I want to take a moment to just appreciate that we have two sort of great art forms in one person. And that's, um, you know, it's not common. It's hard to be a good writer. It's hard to be a good painter. Being both, well, we have <laughs> Robert Henry. I will admit that his writing is a little bit funny at, at points. He, these are, I think are letters and his formatting is very, uh, succinct in the way that he puts very short ideas into little paragraphs. I'll show you when we get to it, but you know, I'm, I'm a really romantic person. I'm not romantic in the sense of mm, ro relationship romantic, but I'm romantic in the sense of absolutely everything else. Um, <laughs> the more struggle, the better, right? And, and, you know, the romance of nature, the romance of living, this, um, you know, all of it. It's a good, it's a good gilded frame to put struggle in, you know, romance. And I get a lot of romance out of Robert Henry, so let's go ahead, I'm going to stop talking, and we're going to get into... Well, just a little bit about backgrounds, and I just like it. I like it so much. Um, even if you're not a painter, I think that you can enjoy this. So here is a snippet titled Backgrounds. With the model before it, the background is transformed. Before the model takes his place, the wall is an identity in itself and is forward. When the model takes his place, the background recedes and exists only as a complement to the figure. Do not look at the background to know its colors or its shapes. Look at the model. What you will see of the background while looking at the model will be the background of that model. All the beauty that can exist in the background rests in its relation to the figure. It is by looking at the figure that you can see this relation. With your eyes well on the model, the value, tones, shapes, which you will apprehend in the background, are those only which are complementary to the figure. The shapes, tones, and values you will apprehend in the same background will differ with each new subject you place before it. The characters of each new subject before the background will claim of it their complements. We are instinctively blind to what is not relative. We are not cameras. We select. We do this always when we are not painting. When you're sitting in conversation with a young girl and you're thinking the while how beautiful she is, suddenly you stop and ask yourself what has been her background? Surely it was not all those incongruous things that are now leaping into your consciousness from behind her. And surely too, while you were sitting there and thinking her so beautiful, you had created, unconsciously, out of chaos, a wonderfully fitting setting which was back of her and around her and fully sufficient to her. In ordinary life, we see backgrounds right, in fact, as they are. When we start painting, we are apt to destroy the background by looking at it 
at the multitudes of things behind the model. Another way of saying it is to say that the head in space creates its own background, that the background becomes an extension of the head, and that it is all the canvas that is the head, not just the part the material head occupies. Some of his phrasing is a little bit of a mouthful, it's kind of hard to work around, um, so bear with me. The background of our beautiful girl is a continuation of her. If her beauty is one of great dignity, the forms of our background will be in harmony or with or will be gracious compliments to this dignity seen in her face. If she is merely chic, or chic, we will find in the background the echoes and the compliments of chic. This will happen even though the material background is precisely the same in each case. All things change according to the state we are in. Nothing is fixed. And this is the part that gets really romantic that I like. Sorry, I... Sorry, that's gross. My... Can't see it. My nose is running a little bit. But it's the way it is. It's very romantic when you think about it. <laughs> okay, so here's the real romantic part. Um, all things change according to the state we are in. Nothing is fixed. I live once in the top of a house in a little room in Paris. I was a student. My place was a romance. It was a mansard room, and it had a small square window that looked out over the housetops, pink chimney pots. I could see the Institute, the Pantheon, and the Tour Saint Jacques. The tiles of the floor were red, and some of them were broken, and got out of place. There was a little stove, a wash basin, a pitcher, piles of my studies. Some hung on the wall and others accumulated dust on their backs. My bed was a cot. It was a wonderful place. I cooked two meals and ate dinner outside. I used to keep the camembert out of the window on the mansard roof between meals, and I made a fine coffee, and I made much of eggs and macaroni. I studied and thought and made compositions, wrote letters home, full of hope of someday being an artist. Mm, he did it. Um, it was wonderful, but days came when hopes looked black, and my art student, uh, paradise was turned into a dirty little room <laughs> with broken tiles. Ashes fell from the stove. It was all hopelessly poor. I was tired of coming bare and eggs and macaroni, and there wasn't a shade of significance in those delicate little chimney pots or the Pantheon, the Institute, or even the Tour Saint Jacques. And I want to take a second to just appreciate that even back, you know, over 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago even, that um, the poor art students were still eating macaroni and cheese, even, even in such a romantic place as France, so that's kind of fun to think about. The material thing is the least part of the background or an environment, and it should be noted, too, that a background is also an environment. For when you paint a background, you're painting all that volume of space, which is the setting of your subject, and this fact should never be lost sight of. The background is more air than it is anything else. In the place in which the model moves, it is the air he breathes. The dimensions of a background are of very great importance. The spaces on either side of the head and above the head can do so many things, good and bad, to the head and the figure, that it is remarkable how little attention is generally paid to them. A figure can be dwarfed by its placement, and if there's no sense of distance back of it and on the side, it will most surely be flattened. From my point of view, the simpler a background is, the better the figure in front will be. And also, I will add, the better the figure is, the less the observer will need entertainment in the background. I'm quite sure many a gold chair has been hauled in because the artist has failed to get distinction and richness in the mean of the sitter. And he counts on the chair to supply the deficiency. But a cocked hat won't make a general. 
There are backgrounds so well made that you have no consciousness of them. The simpler a background is, the more mastery there must be in it. A full and satisfying result must be accomplished with extremely limited means. At times, secreted in the appearance of a simple tone, there's a gamut of color, a shifting across of the spectrum, which keeps the thing alive, elusive, and creates the mystery of depth. On the other hand, one tone with the very slightest change will do the thing. In this case, the tone is in the finest choice of relation to the dominant color of the figure. A background is not to be neglected. It is a structural factor. It is as important to the head before it as the pier is important to the bridge it carries. The background is the support of the head. Many an artist has fussed all day with a face, changing and changing and never getting it right, because the fault should have been found in the background, which he has neglected. The background must travel along and keep pace with every advance of the picture. A right eye travels all over the canvas, for it is an, or an organization of the whole that makes any part. There are echoes everywhere of the feature you are making. A touch on the face may be the causation of a touch on the foot, or, on the contrary, may demand its removal. The eye must be alert, must see the influence of one thing on another, and bring all things into relation. The background as put in the beginning may have been excellent, but the work that has gone on before it may demand its total reconstruction. Nothing is right until all is done and a total unity has been accomplished. It's important to stress attention to the background, for it is a most common habit to neglect it. If there are objects in the background, they must not be painted because they are interesting in themselves. Their only right of existence is as complementary or harmonic benefits to the head or the figure. In other words, when you're painting the background or things in it, you're still painting the head. Your eye is still on the head. You see these things of the background in a relative way only. To paint otherwise is to digress and shift from one subject to another, to paint many pictures in one. When we delight in a thing in nature, all our accounting of its environment is selective. Seeing beauty in nature is a compositional act. Two people may declare to each other the wonder of a sunset or the lo loveliness of a woman, but although they agree, each has made his own selection. Two painters before a sunset or a woman put down on canvas the order of their scene, and thus they communicate to each other their separate ways in drawing. In drawing, Rembrandt, with a cast shadow or just a line or two, realized for us the most com complete sense of space, that is, background environment. He could do this because he saw and he had the genius of selection. Look at his simplest drawings and you will see that he has supreme master in this. Jeez, there's been so much going on outside. Anyway, I'm almost done. And he's going to go ahead and say every head claims its own kind of background. He's literally said this maybe three or four other times. <laughs> Alright, well, I will say... I will say one thing. I think he could stand to be a little bit um, more brief. There are backgrounds that should seem only to be air. It takes some consideration, not only of color and value, but as well of the way the paint is applied and the thickness or thinness of it to make such a background. Many a background has been spoiled simply because the artist has tried to cover it with an insufficient amount of paint, because it was a trouble to paint it all over, because his brush strokes were too much in evidence, because he thought too little of it and did not realize the function it had to perform. The commonest fault is that he determines its color, its value, and its content by looking at it and does not realize that it is 
its marvelous power of change, and that it is wholly a matter of relation. So that's a bit of The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. It's a great painter. You know, I wonder... I think... <laughs> because... Excuse me while I organize my thoughts. Um, I really wonder if he ever saw Van Gogh's work, because that would have been around the same time, and he probably would have hated it. Because there you have that, that's a good example of like that attention to detail in every single <laughs> aspect, you know, the, um, Van Gogh's a very flat painter. Anyway, thanks for joining me, thanks for reading this little thing, sorry. Got a little snot on my sleeve. That's life. Seems to be a lot of crazy stuff happening outside. Um, I'm going to call it a night. You know, it's actually night for the first time. It's been... I've done this at night. It's the first time I've done this at night in a long time. But you know, we're late night reading hour because we choose to read things that maybe are a little bit more, you know, like midnight movies or something. Well, anyway, wish me luck. I'll see you next time.